Yo, what's going on you guys? It's your boy the FWOTI to the biggie here once again with another video. So it is a special day today. Footset Sports is officially one year old today. It was one year ago that I done my first video. So I thought I'd do something special for this occasion. So for the special occasion of the channel being one year old today, I've done an interview with a Wigan legend, Bristol Rovers legend, a man that went from non-league football to the Premier League, the man Nathan the Duke Ellington. Check this out. First of all, Nathan, I'd just like to thank you for taking this time to do this interview with me and that. Um, obviously, I've followed your career for a long time, from Wharton and Nersham all the way through to well, Preston North End. Is that where it's Preston North End? Is that right where you finished? No, no, I moved on to Ipswich after Preston. Okay. And then uh, finished that crew. Finished that crew. Finished that crew. Yeah. I heard a rumour that you went to some e Indonesian club or something and you didn't like it. And you came home. <laughs> I had to take some pictures of that place. It was unbelievable. Was it mad? The pitch trained on was disgraceful. Um, the training ground was obviously had no facilities whatsoever. The pitch was like a park, but it had been an abandoned park. Like it's really, really bad. A bad, uh, bad. It just, yeah, it was, it, was, it, was, it was an experience, but um, I enjoyed it at the same time. Not that wasn't the reason why. It's just. It was just a bit too unprofessional for me, and I couldn't see myself staying there. So I just thought I'd, I'd, I'd move on. To be honest, no, that's fair enough. How long did you out in Indonesia for? Um, I, I went to Thailand first. Okay. And then I went to Indonesia for. I actually was in Indonesia for about two weeks, actually. Okay. Two weeks, and the traffic in Jakarta is it's, there's nothing that can be it. Nothing. Crazy. It's nothing. There's nothing that can be that. So we even had to train very early in the morning to, to get there in slight heavy traffic <laughs> about five, six in the morning to get there for, for like seven. And it was only like round the corner as well. But so bad, it's unbelievable. That's mad. Oh, they need to fix it. That's mad. Um, obviously, you started out at Walsh Nersham. Um how long before, because you got scattered by Bristol Rovers, right, when you were at Wharton? Yeah. How long was that process? How long was um, Ian Holloway watching you for before, obviously, he made his move? Um, to be honest, what happened was, uh, so I moved to Wharton and Hersham youth team with the last two months of the season going, because uh, two of my friends were down there, um, Gavin Holligan and Fabio Carpini. Mm -hmm. So, um uh, basically, they were killing it, and, and they just said, "Look, you should come down and play for our team." So, I went down there, <coughs> ended the season uh, with them, won the uh, won the league, and scored like twenty plus goals with the last two months to go. And uh, the, the the first team manager, he said, "Listen, you know, I want to get you playing in the first team uh, for next season." And um, so I played there. Uh, I didn't even play. I wasn't starting much for the first team because obviously. I was just getting older and, and yeah, I was just like 16, just turning 17 in July. So that happened and the season started and I was on the bench coming off and scoring a couple of goals. And then um, Ian Holloway, he told me, we went, we was playing against Sutton United 
he came down and watched me against Sutton United and he said it took him 20 minutes to decide that's what he wants he left he left after 20 minutes he said he's gonna buy me so um he said well, one of the things that I did was the ball was coming like over the top mm-hmm. and um, I had my eyes fixed on the ball and I swiped to still kick it even though the defender headed it out and he says I like that you you know you, you was doing something you was you was expecting it to come even though the defender was going to head it so he's like I like that uh, so um, you'd already like, basically you'd already seen what was going on before and you were just yeah, already going through the motions yeah anticipating before reacting that's what he's saying and, yeah. and if you see that something like that in someone it's a, it must be a major thing. So he just he said, look, that, that made up my mind. He obviously, with all the, the good words that he heard about me, and then that on it as well, that made up his mind straight away. Um, so when did you sign for Bristol Rovers? What year did you join Bristol Rovers? 99. 99. So that would have been about a year after the last time I played in the same team as you then. <laughs> See, people Probably, forget yeah. that. People forget that. I can say that I played in the same team as Nathan Allen. And the only thing I didn't like about that, right, and I'm going to be honest, is when you played, Andre would stop playing me forward and he'd put me in defence. <laughs> Andre like, now nah, nah, Nathan's playing today, you're playing centre-back. I'm like, what? <laughs> I, don't, no, I don't want to play centre-back. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, you scored a hat-trick in the FA Cup against Derby County when they were a premiership yeah. side at the time. What yeah. was that feeling like? The best feeling ever, to be fair. I remember driving down on that day because we was allowed to drive um, to the game. And uh, it was a cup game. Um, we got we got down to the ground, and um, I think we stayed overnight. And then we uh, we had the game on that day, and just it was just surreal, really, because obviously I'm playing against Ravenelli people, people, a person like Ravenelli who I watched. Yeah, yeah, because Rav- I forgot that Rav- Ravenelli was at, at Derby at the time as well. It was just after his Barrow run. Yeah, so that's a guy that I, I, I watched in, on Channel 4 when I was a youngster. You know, watching him banging in the goals in Italy and then seeing him come over here and do well and then I'm playing against him on the same pitch and then to score and then to score a hat-trick, it was just like, wow. You know, I, I, I couldn't explain the feeling. You're just on the field and you've done that well. And it was just one of them feelings where you just don't want it to end. Yeah. You just, I, from all my friends came down from London they watched the game and they were just having, they were so buzzing. I had my, my small 2 uh, I think it was a 206 cc and it was a full car full of adults. So the guys <laughs> at the back where their legs were breaking, but it didn't matter. So they were really, really happy. Obviously, that did well and we got through. Uh, so, yeah. That was, if I'm right by thinking, didn't you score a hat trick for Bristol Rovers? Was it like two hat tricks in six days or something around about that time? <laughs> Yeah, it was three hat tricks in that month, in the, in the same month. month. So, uh, scored a hat trick against Swansea, um, uh, man, a hat trick against Leighton Orient. I'm sure that it was Swansea at home and Leighton Orient at home, and then the Derby hat trick away. So it was, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a great month that month. <laughs> that that wasn't the that wasn't the only hat trick you scored in the FA Cup. Did you not score another hat trick in the FA Cup, or was that? Am I thinking the same? Yeah, for what? Well, for West Brom. Uh, for Wigan against West Brom, I scored a hat trick as well against them. So, yeah. Would you, would you say Jason Roberts was at West Brom and uh, he came down? He wasn't starting, um, so I wanted to obviously play against him because I hadn't played with him since the days of Bristol Rovers. Yeah, uh, he came down as a Premiership outfit, um, and I managed to get a hat trick against them too. So it was, it was nice. It was nice. Speaking of Jason Roberts, I'm, I'm going to be honest, like because obviously I followed your career. When I think Shearer Sutton. York Cole, you always think Edderton Roberts. What yeah, was it like yeah. playing with Jason? It's a dream. Absolute dream. Um, you know, you only, like I said, you only dream of playing with players that have got that feeling of wanting you to do as good as they want. Mm-hmm. You know, so he, we were good friends off the field and then great, you know, great partnership on the field. And for, if you got that, that link, off the field and then you come onto the field and I wanted to set him up I had more, as much pleasure setting him up as, uh, as scoring a goal and so did he and we knew our games inside out to be fair if you put us both together it was impossible to stop because we had everything we had the, the aerial ability we had the pace we had the power we had the finesse we had absolutely everything together so I would say it was a bit unplayable at times 
So it was it was really a dream to to have that. And many strikers, I'm telling you now, there's not they're few and far between where you're going to have a partnership that care about each other, each other's success as much. But, and and the thing is, you could even see that even just watching the game, you could see that you could see that you do had that like the York and Cole special bond or a Shearer and Sutton, you know. And and there was always pictures of you both together all the time and, and always laughing and joking and all that. Um, obviously, we have to say that, and to be fair, Wigan getting to the Premiership was pretty much carried by you and Jason that year. What was that whole experience of that season like? Uh, that season was an amazing, amazing season. But what I can tell you is, it's probably because, you know, not many people know the names of players in the lower league so much. But that team, make no mistake, was an amazing squad, an amazing team. Every single player was um, absolutely amazing. Uh, when I came there, and I was in Division Two, um, and they said they said they just needed a striker to make it make it all work. And uh, when I came, I realised that really they, that's all they needed. Yeah. I came in, I scored the goals, and everything else was, you know, they were rock solid at the back. The goalkeeper was amazing. Um, Fylan, John Fylan, one of the best, probably the best keeper I've played with, I'd say. And if I was to talk about best players, it will be full of Wigan players. Best players I've played with. I mean, so, um, that, that team was amazing. I mean, you think about what it done for Jimmy Bullard's career. And on that note, what is it like being around Jimmy Bullard? Like, you see him on telly and he's like a madman pulling his shorts up and having his pictures taken. What is it like being around Jimmy all the time at the training ground? That's him. All the time, he's always got something crazy to do. He's always doing something crazy and saying something crazy. He just has a laugh, and that's him. He got no boundaries. He just don't mess. He just messes about too much. And uh, obviously, it's fun to have someone like that around. And and but the thing is, when he's on the field, he wants that ball. He wants to make things happen. And you know, it was great to play with him. Uh, alongside him and uh, yeah we had a lot of success together. Yeah, the thing with Jimmy that a lot of people don't realise is he's quite a gifted football player I, mean, I think the pranks are starting to take that but he, his vision and some of the balls and passes that he can play you and, you and Jay, Jason must have been just having a field day it was great it was, it was great to have someone like him and obviously we had Kavanagh we had uh, Jason Jarrah who was destroyer he used to destroy but he used to when he would play and he was on his game he was pretty much like a Vieira for us. So, you know, so we didn't just have Jimmy, but Jimmy obviously had great free kicks, good corners, um, good uh, vision to see us and put us in. And it was just all over the park. You know, he never, he, he's got that energy as well. So when we did bleep test, he'd always run till the, the bleep, bleep test finished. So he was, that, he was that fit as well. So, yeah, it was great to play alongside him. Obviously, that season you got promoted to the Premier League. I'll be honest with you, I was really looking forward to seeing you in a Wigan shirt in the Premier League. But then you moved to West Brom. The one thing I've always wanted to ask you, Nathan, is did you want to leave Wigan? Because I thought you were so happy there. Obviously, it was a, you moved in the end, but did you really want to leave Wigan? I would have stayed at Wigan. You would have still seen me at Wigan today. If, if, if it was, you know, if things went the right way, I think I would have still been at Wigan today. Uh, I never wanted to leave Wigan. Um, you know, I loved it there. It was, it was the best playing experience I've, I've had. Um, the best squad I played with. Um, the best um, atmosphere. I was loved. I was like the main, pretty much one of the main men at the yeah. club. Still I to this day, the, but still to yeah. even to this day, Nathan. I look at people talking about Wigan, and your name still mentioned, and it's even the same with Bristol Rovers as well. They still mention you. When they talk about yeah. Wigan, you and you and Jason obviously together again and that lot. Um, yeah, I'll be honest. As much as your career still went on after that, it, it was kind of like even for me following your career, I was like, ah, oh, after all that hard work they done at Wigan, wouldn't it have been nice to see him? Especially because they had that cup run as well, where they played Man United in the League Cup that year as well. And it was like I remember sitting there watching that League Cup final. I was like, you know what, being a Man United fan, this is nice. But how nice would it be to see Nathan playing in this game as well? Yeah, well, to be honest. Bristol Rovers and, and Wigan are the two clubs that obviously I'd done my best in and, and had the best times in terms of a football career. Um, and, you know, that's the two places that have the best, that, that hold the, the fondest in my memories anyway. But um, as for the Premiership season when I left, it was due to, you know, principles really. Um, you know, the, the, there's a lot that went on. Uh, I would say if anyone in my position, they would have they would have had to move themselves as well. 
Uh, you know, the day I left, I was even crying, leaving the, the, the training ground, saying bye to everyone. I didn't want to leave the place, but um, things were the way they were. So, you know, the, the, they had a reputation of having players and, and bringing through a great squad on the cheap. Yeah. And um, that's what they re- that was what they were, um, that's what they were known for, for, for having a great squad, but not having to pay so much for them. I'm not saying that obviously I was asking for lots of money, but what it was was um, when I signed, I was in Division 2. And at that time, I signed a contract saying that a negotiation, if we get promoted from Division 2 to the Championship. So that season, I actually was top scorer at the club with 23 goals, 22 goals. And we, we won the league by a country mile, over 100 points. And... They, and the end of the whole season, I played with my shoulder coming out because uh, obviously the manager had a chat with me. He said, listen, get your operation at the end of the season. Let's get you through to the end of the season and then have your operation on your shoulder. So I played that season. My shoulder must have come out at least 100 times. Um, but I played anyway. We got up. We got to the championship. And the man and the chairman, you know, he said, look, nobody's tested in this league. Nobody's proven. So we're not going to give any contracts until we pro- they've proven that they can we can hold our own in that league. So I said, fair enough, no problem. But at the time, I said, it's in my contract, though. should give me a new deal. But he says, how can we negotiate for an injured player? So um, I said, no problem. I'll prove myself, and then I'll get another deal. Um, end of that season came, and that was when Jason Roberts came towards the end of that season. And uh, so he came on a good deal. It was no problem. Double what I was on um, at the time. Had no qualms with that. Played the next season, and we obviously we got uh, promoted. I was top scorer in the whole of the championship this time. Um, so for me, I'd played a whole season um, without a new contract. The next season, the whole season, top scorer in the league, and we're promoted to the Premiership this time. And I had one year left on my contract. So for me, I was expecting them to to do me a favour and say, look, let's take into consideration two years of no new contract. And the fact that I'm top scorer and what I've done for the club, hopefully I can get a good deal. And um, basically, I was uh, I, I, I was told um, <laughs> that I can go into all the details, but I was told that I didn't do too well that season, and um, I should take the deal that they're going to offer me. And um, in the end, they said that they was going to offer me a deal that made me top played in the in the club. But um, little did they know that obviously me and Jason are that close up. I know what he's on. And um, yeah. that didn't make me top. I said, you know, what, what? why would you say I'm top when, you know, Jason's is more than that? And um, obviously they look surprised and stuff like that. But, you know, the, the past is the past. But the reality is, is I saw a few players leave before me and they were all didn't want to leave. They were all upset. They said, listen, I don't want to leave, but, you know, I, I'm not getting a, a good enough deal. I can't stay. So I saw two or three players move on and I thought, they won't do that to me. Surely they value me enough. And um, in the end, you know, my agent um, basically came from London to, 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 to negotiate and they wasn't there to negotiate. Um, so then my agent had to go back to London and then they um, arranged another meeting. It wasn't there again to negotiate. So the chairman was away on holiday on the times when he was supposed to negotiate my deal. So I couldn't actually get an answer. I couldn't get a deal sorted out. And I was thinking, you know, this is not um, the best position to be in. I've got one year left. I want a deal sorted out. I want them to take into consideration the, the, the past, the last two years. And they didn't really um, facilitate that at all. Yeah. And uh, to be honest, uh, what happened then was um, I was advised to actually see out my year and play there. And that would have been great because obviously at the end of the season, then you can go for free anywhere or you can get a proper good deal. Yeah. But uh, at the time when my wife was pregnant and um, I said to myself, listen, I don't want to take that risk of one year without with one year left of my contract. If anything was to happen, I've got no backup, no backup in terms of financials. So I thought, you know, I need a deal sorted um, to, to protect my family. Um, and that was the time when Brian Robson came and he wanted me at uh, West Brom and um, obviously as a Man United supporter Brian Robson that's yeah, like a point of zero he's like the man wow hmm? it's like, he's like the man for any Man United fan he's like, he's like one of the men you know what I mean and 
Exactly. Yeah. And then West Brom, you know, I'm looking at them and saying, well, they've just stayed up. And I looked at their squad, I'm like, you know what? I know how good our Wigan squad is. And we could hold our own in the Prem. I'm, I, I certainly believe that at the time, before we even started the first game. Our first game was going to be against Chelsea. Um, so what happened is I was like, this is worse ways of sideways movement, but at least I'll get a deal that I deserve. I just wanted a deal, a deal that I deserve, and that was it. And um, so for me, I actually uh, had to say, OK, goodbye, I'm going to leave. Because of that, there's a, a bit more to the story, but that's the main crux of it. And um, while I was on my way to sign, we can call and offer me a deal, which was still considerably less than what they offered, West Brom offered me. Mm-hmm. But I would have still signed for that if they had just just been straight with me from the beginning and said, "Look." So, so it was more like. Sign. So it was more like you felt that they were just they were just stringing you along, and in a, in a way you had to show them that you were willing to go, really, for them to then put their hands in their pockets to try and pull out a deal. Exactly, but in the end, they knew they had to put their money in their pockets and get players like Emil Heskey on much much more, and all the other big players because they know Premiership is no joke. You mm-hmm. need to spend if you want to make it, you know, big. So they ended up doing that further down the line when they were pushed to, but. At that time, I think they felt that they could still get me on, you know, much cheaper than I, I deserve to be on. And um, I think there was, you know, there was a bit, obviously, the clubs, they want to do that, don't they? They yeah. want their best players for the cheapest possible and the players they want to get the most possible without uh, within within reason. So I understand that. So I don't have nothing against the chairman, the manager, you know, anybody there. All I know is that, you know, it wasn't right for both of us in the end. And I had to go, but I didn't want to go. And yeah. That's the reality of it. I didn't ever want to leave that club, and um, but I had to go. Which is fair enough. So you moved on to West Brom, and that leads me into my next question, because you know what I'm going to say here, and I, I already know in your mind, I know what he's going to say. Being a Man United fan like me, that season you scored twice. Am I, was it twice against Man United? One at home, yeah. one on away. What was it like? Honestly, it's really... I'm, I'm just, just walking out Old Trafford being a Man United fan anyway. What, what was that like, Nathan? Uh, that day, that was a day where, you know, you're just sitting there and you wake up in the morning and you're just ready straight away. I can't wait for this day, you know. And I'm on the coach and I'm just thinking about when I'm going to see the, the stadium when I get next to it. And, and then I go into the changing, changing room and then I see all the players coming through the tunnel and I'm like, wow. I better savor this. Going down the tunnel and I'm about to walk out, I'm like, this is Old Trafford. <laughs> I'm about to play at Old Trafford. So it was just an amazing feeling. That felt like the first day of my my professional career at Bristol Rovers. When I walked through the tunnel at Bristol Rovers, I was really nervous because I've never played in front of thousands before. Yeah. It was just like hundreds. So then for me to walk out of that place there at Bristol Rovers and see all the fans and I was like, wow, this is me playing football and so many people coming to watch. And then just to go to Old Trafford and see that, you know, it's Old Trafford. It's what I've watched since I was five, a club that I've supported since five. It's just uh, surreal. It's one of them things where you just always remember everything that happened in the game. And um, it's just an amazing feeling. You can't really explain it. It's just great to know that I've been able to achieve against United at Old Trafford. And and scoring past Edwin Van der Sar as well. Pardon? Scoring past Edwin Van der Sar as well. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? And... Yeah, so to be able to score as well, you know, it's one of them things. You always want to do well against a team you supported. You know, obviously, as a supporter, you want to see them win games. Then when you're playing against them, it's about, you know, wanting to obviously get a goal and show that you're good. And um, I managed to do that. And um, yeah, it was, it was another thing that I can look at and, Keep reminiscing over in the future. Between me and you, and I want the truth here, and I want you to lie, do you <laughs> go to people, you know, I played on the same pitch as Ronaldo and I scored and he didn't? <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> well, it's, it's a different level, isn't it? So when you're playing in the game uh, and you you don't really, that's that's like the people who have not been there yet, they kind of have that kind of banner. But I guess the players, it's, it's, it's seen as the norm, if you get what I mean. Yeah. Once you're doing it week in, week out, it feels like the norm. So um, that's how it's always felt after 
after a little while, it's it's like a normal job, isn't it? <laughs> Going out there and doing your thing, and obviously, all the the first time you do certain things, it's got a special feeling. When you're doing it over and over again, it becomes more more normal for you. Yeah, I, I remember talking to Robbie L years ago when he played for Wimbledon, and and I was when I I was still like on my road to football and that like, and, and I remember asking him what's it like to be a professional footballer and he said to me he goes you know what after a while the love of the game stops because it's just a job and he goes you yeah. kind of separate that and, and I was like I remember being a kid thinking oh, I don't want football to feel like that but I can now I'm like older you can kind of understand what he's saying mm. yes yeah, uh, obviously the love of the game I guess the love of the game stays but in terms of you know, like, if you can go to the part when you want to play football, but then someone's telling you you've got to go, it's a bit different. Yeah. That, that's, I think that's what it is. It's like you've got a boss telling you when to come in, when not to come in, what you've got to do, how much of it you've got to do. It's a bit different. That's why it's a job. It's something you love, but it's obviously a job as well, and there's a responsibility to, to continually be at that top level and keep pushing yourself to, to be better yourself all the time. And obviously, the players that enjoy playing so much, I really enjoyed it. So I always wanted to better myself every year. And when I was playing week in, week out, if you look at my career stats, you'll see that every single year I wanted to get more goals. And I did get more goals than the previous season. It went from, I think, 17 to 18 to 19 to 21 to 23 to 24. And then I stopped playing every week. And that's when, obviously, the goals a game's ratio is going to be be slashed. So, What was it like? I'm, I'm thinking about that West Brom squad when you were there. You had Kanu there, right? What was it like playing alongside Kanu? Because again, as someone who's represented Nigeria, played for Arsenal, played in the World Cup, and to have that like experience and fall back on and talk to you if, if you needed like a little bit of advice on that, that must be... Kanu was uh, another player who... I'd played with on international superstar soccer. I don't know if you remember yeah. what it was called. <laughs> yeah. Super Nintendo. I played with him. I played with him through all of them times when I was really young. And, um, you know, to then get in the same squad as him and play with him is just unbelievable. You know, so, and he was another player who had a striker to play with. Again, he set up pretty much 99.9% .9 of my goals I ever scored at West Brom. So, for him, the touches he had, it's just brilliance. So, you know, it, he's definitely up there. Him and Jason Roberts were the two strikers, I would say, I had that connection with, and you can't beat. You can't beat a connection like that. Uh, hence why me and him had both, uh, we were both top scorers that season, actually, with five league goals um, between us. Uh, I had eight in, altogether in, in that season. So I was the top scorer in the club, uh, having played like 18 starts. Uh, that pre Premiership season, I remember my, pretty much all my stats. So uh, you know, so it was it was a great it was great to play with someone like him. You know, so cool. he's great. There's one more question I want to ask you before we move on to obviously you started your football academy now. But there's one more question I want to ask because um, I don't really want to touch too much on the Watford stuff because and there's a reason why I don't want to talk about the Watford stuff is because you got a lot of hate at Watford. It to be the right terms and I don't really want to talk about that because I think a lot of it was really unnecessary but obviously you played under Ian Holloway Paul Jewell Brian Robson Malky Mackay all these kind of like well known managers who was your favourite? Obviously I had the most uh, it's, it's weird because uh, I can't say one one manager i got to say uh, a few managers for different things Ian Holloway he was great for my progression, my learning of the game. Him and Gary Penrice, they're the, pretty much the best at teaching. I can't tell you there's any other manager that really taught me how to do things. Not tell me how, tell me to do things. Taught me how. And that was one of the things Gary Penrice always said. He says, there's no point telling you to do something better. Teach them how to do it better. And that's what I, I learned my bread and butter with, with, with Gary, Gary Penrice and Ian Holloway. Uh, me and Bobby Zamora, the countless days in training together, me and him playing in the youth team and then getting time out to, to work on getting hold of the ball, different touches and different skills, different skills to get out of trouble. They were, the, Ian Holloway, they, they, 
it was just unbelievable to it, it, there's a lot that I could say that I learned from them and then, and to be fair if you look at all the other managers they were good in their own way but in terms of learning they were the two that stood out uh, and that was like obviously the manager and the coach but um and then you've got most successful under Paul Jewell so he taught me about obviously manning up at the times when my shoulder was falling out and obviously giving him responsibility of of the goals to get at the club and then obviously winning that league and then getting promotion to the premiership again. So I only um, experienced winning at that club. So under him, he had a great philosophy with the players that we had and it worked. Obviously didn't work at the other clubs um, as, as well, but um, it really worked at Wigan. And then you've got, I'd say, Malky Mackay, the way he did things, he was a player's manager. He did what the manager, what the players wanted, but within his structure. And it was amazing. You know, I really liked the way he dealt with things, the way he had his team playing, the football he wanted to play, the pre-season he had in place, how he deals with you after a game, before a game, the man management. Mikey Mackay was someone I would really say straight away when he got that Watford job, that's his first job. He had everything in place, perfect. And I was like, you know what? If I was a manager, I'd love to do things the way he's done it. So that stuck, stuck out a lot. But again, you've got, you know, Tony Mowbray, when he came into West Brom, he, he, he stamped his authority on the game. He had Mark Venus with him. He used to help out a lot as well. So they, they played a good standard of football. It's, it's really hard. It, it's, even at Preston, you know, the manager, um, let me slip my mind now, um, What's his name? Uh, Brown, Phil Brown. He was another one that he focuses on man management a lot. Not in terms, no, he does, it's not about helping you improve your game because obviously he expects you to have that level of ability already. But his man management was also good as well. So there's a few that I look at in different ways. So if you want to talk about in terms of the best manager to help, Ian Holloway and Gary Prenrice, they're them two together. Talk about the best run team, I'd say Marky McKay. I think that's the best way of, of putting it. It's them two at the top of the tree as people who are going to progress you. That's cool. So just a couple of things I want to quickly talk about before because I've taken a lot of your time up already, Nathan, and I didn't mean to do that. Um, obviously, you've got the academy going now. Where did that all start from? When did you decide that you wanted to start the academy and that? You know what it is? It's um, when, the, when your career is over, you know, you're not, no longer playing and that's something that you've become a master at, at playing a game. You know, you've become a professional in a certain field. Not many people are, you know, can, can say that about themselves. And, and obviously, if you've got something that valuable, you want to use that. Yeah. You know, so if somebody becomes a professional at something else, like, you know, doctors, they become a professional at being a doctor. So they'll use that to their advantage. Me, that's what I'm, I've known for how many years. So it's... It's a natural thing for many football players to go into something in the same field. And um, to be honest, I didn't really like the coaching side of things at first. But, um, you know, I thought, you know what, let's have a go at it. Let's try and see how it goes. And um, I just opened up um, an academy, a uh, soccer academy a while ago. We call it soccer, I don't know. We're well, in England, but it's a football academy. But, um, yeah, it's a general session. And um, I'm really getting more and more comfortable with the, the coaching side of things now and it's becoming much more enjoyable so yeah that's that's where it started out and a few people were telling me listen you should start your own academy mm -hmm. you know you've got quite a few out there you, sh you should be a brand you should use your name your brand to actually um, you know to make something good and, and give back to the community so that's where it's all started and it's it's really uh, kicked on really well because I've got a general session called Ellington Soccer, yeah. but um, another ex-pro um, I'm working with as well, and we have, um, it's pretty much like an academy. So it's players that we're going to be mentoring and helping and giving them sessions. We give them a supplementary session here and there, like every fortnight, to help them with different little things about their game, to just uh, also give them the mental aspects um, and the know-how of what's, what to expect in the future should they get into the pro game? Should they be training with the first team? What kind of differences in academy training and pro training, you know, is going to give them? And 
that's becoming really, really rewarding as well. So both the both the academies, are, I'm really enjoying. I'm really enjoying. No, it's good. It's and it's also always good to give back to the community and that lot, and giving the kids something. Especially in this day and age, you know, it's all kind of pro. Like the kids have got to have somewhere to go, something to do, keep them off the streets and that lot. So, what better way than football? You know, this it's the best way. You've seen it with Righty doing it with the prisons and that lot, and you're doing yeah. your thing, man. I, and I couldn't be more than happy for you, man. Um, one quick thing before we go, we're going to talk Man United briefly, quickly. Um, obviously, both being big Man United fans. What did you think of last night and what have you thought of the season so far this year? Okay, so last night, um, I was I was happy with the, the way we played, to be honest. Uh, in the end, when you look at it, we, we controlled the game at their ground. Uh, Pogba totally controlled that midfield and we was missing that in the last game at home against Swansea. So um, I was happy that he returned. And obviously to see Rashford up front is it, a breath of fresh air in terms of pace and, and hurting teams. And... Um, I really felt that you know he's come of age as well, even more. He's he stepped on, he stepped to the plate every time he was needed, and again he showed another string to his bow by scoring a free kick. Yeah. And we all thinking, why is he on set pieces now, and why is he taking free kicks? This is why. In the background, he's been training and working really hard. Now it's time to show it on that field. So I'm really, really happy with Rashford's progression. Um, I just feel like we've got uh, obviously a whole load of injuries at the minute, and uh, but we've got. Players that probably we've got Martial that's probably better up through the middle as well, uh, and then Rashford who's up better up through the middle. So it's, it's a tough one because we need to have that balance throughout the side. And I think Mourinho this season is what he's got so far. He's added to. He's made an amazing signing in Bay. Uh, Pogba's done really well in midfield. Um, for me, I think Pogba that's the type of player he is, and people are asking too much for him from him. I think he's that kind of player. He's a midfield player that is he's not very defensive and he's not someone who's going to get you 30 goals, 25 goals a season at the moment. Yeah. I think he'll get 20-plus goals in the next few seasons. Let's say next season or the next, he'll continually start doing that now because he gets enough chances as it is. So, but what he does is he just bosses that midfield and keeps the ball and just keeps it ticking for us. That's what his job is. And... Uh, I don't know a lot of people saying I we paid this much for him and he should be giving you this. Well, that's not the kind of player he is. We knew that before yeah. we bought him. Yeah, I've, so. I've been fair, I think I think Pogba's taken a lot of unnecessary stick. Um, there's oh, and there's been a handful of games where I think he could have done better, but majority he's yeah. been solid pretty much most yeah. of the games he's played. And obviously Jose has looked at him and obviously Slatan as well as the go-to guys this season who have really been the backbone of the team. So. I think it is some fair criticism and I think a lot of it has to come with the, the, the ridiculous price tag. Um, yeah. Obviously, too uh, many... Too many with, with the price tag, with the price tag, I heard that they earn the money back within a few days of the, 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 the shirt sales anyway, so... Yeah. That's great business. Yeah, yeah no, so. that's what that's what I heard. I actually heard that when they signed him, where people were going, oh, no, price tag. But the business side of it that um, Ed Woodward had put in place was we were going to make like triple that back anyway if I buy signed him. So everyone exactly. was thinking, oh, you spend this money on a player, but you're not looking at Manchester United as well as being a football team as a business these days. You exactly. know, and they wouldn't do anything when they know it's going to cost the club a load of money. Um, exactly. Who would you like to see coming in the summer? Obviously, they're talking about Griezmann. Me, personally, as a fan, I would love to see someone like uh, Bernardo Silva. You know, like the old style Kinchelskis and Giggs that we used to have, because I feel like we really struggle without wingers at Man United now and pace. Yeah, to be honest, uh, I look at the team and I, I think if Griezmann come, where would he play? Um, to be honest, I don't see... He's a good player, very good player, but I don't see where he's going to fit in to make Man United way better than they are right now when certain players would have to come out to have him in. So I think it'd be very tough because I, I hear that he's a, he's a forward. He's not like one of the three behind. So it's a bit difficult to are you gonna put him up front and not play Rashford. I think Rashford needs to get you know some games now. Yeah. To be honest, I think we haven't got proper uh, wingers. Like, like you're saying, like, OK, they're not all wingers now because it's the, the, the three behind the striker. But um, of the, the right side and the left side, OK, you can play Mkhitaryan out, right? But I'd like to see someone of the mould of Royce, Marco Royce, someone like that, or even Alexis Sanchez, who, who's played out on the left of the three uh, behind the striker. 
He's already proven that he scores plus 20, 20 plus goals. That kind of player is what we need. And uh, we need another player in central defensive position to obviously take over Carrick's spot because he's obviously getting older now. We need someone who's got energy like Kante to be able to to do the, the, the hard work to let Pogba go off and, and, and be free to do the other work. And to be honest, I think we're quite strong at the back. It's proven this season. He, they surprised me more than ever, but you look at Bailly, he's, he's solid as a rock. And then everyone else, Valencia, he's getting a bit older, so we might want to bring in another one to, to support him and then take over when he gets older. But um, to be honest, it's, it's, it's obviously, we'd, I would say Martial up top with Rashford swapping between them and someone more on the left or the right who's, who's naturally got that uh, engine to get up and down like Mourinho wants, but to have the pace. Yeah. To have the pace and, and, and kill it for us, I think. That's what will make the difference next season for us going forward. Yeah, to be fair, I think the only thing Manchester United really lack is that kind of defence into attack that you used to get with like Ronaldo Rudy really, when they were younger and they just used to break at you in speed and we really seem to lack that. With Rashford, he seems to do it, but then he realises, hold on, there's no one with me here, I'm going to have to stop and hold up play for a bit and you're like, no, 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 just keep on going, <laughs> keep on going, but... No, I'd like to see some wheels come in as well. I'll, I'll agree with you on that one. But Nathan, I want to thank you for your time, man. I know I've taken up a lot of your time tonight, and I only said 20 minutes, but I've taken 40 off you. So, But I want to no thank problem. you for doing this interview, man, and I really appreciate it. No problem. That was fun anyway, so it's always good to talk football. Well, we'll do it again sometime then. We'll do it again. Anytime. Anytime. Cool, Anytime. man. I'll be in touch. Okay. All right, take All right. care, brother. Thanks a lot, Dan. All All right. Right. Cheers, bye. So that is the complete 40 minute interview now done. You guys have seen a lot. I want to thank you guys for joining me on this momentous occasion. I never ever thought a year ago when I started Footset Sports I'd make it to a year. Um, and I know a lot of people who were supporting channel didn't think I'd make it to a year. But you guys, all your love and support that you've given me over the years. Some of you subscribers stuck from me from day dot all the way through to now. And I want to thank you all. You're the force behind Footset Sports. You're the one that keeps Footset Sports going. Remember to like, share, subscribe and peace people. I'll be back soon. Take care.